Good evening. My name is Kimberly Carew. I'm the Party Morris House Coordinator. And our 2021 summer series was made possible with the support from the UI Lighting Up the Arts. We'd also like to thank Alder, Salvatore Decola, the East Shore Management Team, and our Morris Cove neighbors. Tonight's presentation, Chickadee Tales, a New Haven Bird Club anthology, was supposed to take place at the Party Morris House on August 22nd, but instead we had a guest, her, an uninvited guest, Hurricane Henri. So this is our postponed date, um, and it is our pleasure to welcome both Gail Martino and John Triana. Gail Martino is the chair of the indoor program for the New Haven Bird Club and serves as a surveyor for the Connecticut Bird Atlas Project, whose goal is to document species during breeding and non-breeding periods. Originally trained as a neuroscientist, Gail has held several academic and corporate positions and is currently Senior Manager of Innovation at Unilever. In addition to code editing, uh, Chickadee Tales, an anthology of the New Haven Bird Club, she has also published a children's book featuring birds uh, called A Friend for Blue. And John Triana is the current historian for the New Haven Bird Club. He joined the club while in middle school and served as the organization's president during its centennial in 2007. He conducted much research on the history of the club and its members. John is employed as a regional real estate manager by the Regional Water Authority. We welcome both Gail and John Triana. Thank you so much, Kim, for that, that very kind intro. Give me a moment to, um, to show my, my slides. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. As Kim said, I'm, I'm Gail Martino and I'm the indoor chair of the New Haven Bird Club. And one of my responsibilities as indoor chair is I put together our, our speaker series. So once a month, we bring in speakers from the Connecticut birding community um, and also outside. And we have a variety of topics on birds, birders, and, and birding. And I've been doing this for a few years now. And as, as I sit back and I listen to many of of the stories, particularly for those folks who've been involved in the club for a significant amount of time, it was, it was just clear to me that we needed to write these things down, uh, you know, and, and to document these stories of how single, a single individual can make um, an in incredible contribution to conservation and to birds or how teams of people ha um, have been monitoring um, the changes in, in Connecticut climates, habitats, birds, bird behavior, and also how nonprofits like the New Haven Bird Club has teamed up with other nonprofits um, to create something much bigger. And I, I thought it was important enough to, um, uh, to write down that, um, you know, we, uh, we, we put it together in an anthology, which we're calling the, the Chickadee Tales. Now, um, there's something for everyone in, in this book. So if you're interested in birds, there's stories in, in the book about birds. If you're, if you're interested in science, there's some that are interested, there are essays about science. If you're, if you're interested in uh, photography, there's something in there about that. And <laughs> if you're interested in romance and how birding has, has led to um, a, an incredible love affair over the, over the years, it's, it's in there. And these are all wonderful stories from folks like you from, from Connecticut who have um, you know, made, made a connection with birds. One of the, the most important 
um, aspects of the birth uh, of, of this book is looking at the foundations um, and the, the history. And that's one of the things that we're going to feature tonight. And my colleague, John Triana, who is the New Haven Bird Club historian, um, is going to be is going to take you through some of our foundations because that's a good way to kind of highlight some of the things that that the club does and um, some of our, our key key programs, special programs, our um, educational admissions, some of the some of the key members that have made incredible contributions and, and so forth. So these are some of the topics that's in the book itself, um, Chickadee Tales. Um, and for those of you uh, who are interested in the book, uh, Kim is going to be telling you, you know, um, more information about how you can get a copy of, of the book. Um, if you have any questions about the book, we'll show you how to how to get in touch with um, with me as uh, as one of the the editors. Uh, um, uh, of the book, but there's also other ways that you can get involved with the club. So for example, there's two times of the year that is a really great time to be, uh, to get involved in birding. One is at the beginning of, of the spring when all the, the birds migrate up from the, from the south. Um, so that's like the April and, and May time. But the other time that people may not think think about in the same in the same way if you're if you're not a uh, a regular birder is in the fall because that's when uh, the birds who have nested now return to um, to the south and we're very fortunate in New Haven because we have two incredible properties this is just one of many. We've got East Rock, which is um, a great place to bird in the spring. And then we have Lighthouse Park, which is a great place to, to bird in the fall. Now, <clears throat> the New Haven Bird Club sponsors a hawk watch every single day. And we just started from September 1st uh, to the beginning of, of December. And it's from nine in the morning to 12 noon. And if you go to Lighthouse Park and you go into the big field, you're going to see a bunch of people with binoculars. And they are, um, and they're actually counting the number of birds that are flying over hawks, um, uh, for example, hawks, eagles, ospreys, um, and so forth. One of the nice things, if you're new to birding, one of the nice things about going to Hawk Watch is that the birds are generally big. So they they can be easier to spot. And um, it's a great, and you can stay in one place. So if you don't like to go hiking in the woods, it's a great, this is a perfect time for you because you could stay in one place, you can learn about the different birds flying flying by, why they fly over the park and and so forth and um, um, and talk to the other birders there. It's open to everyone. Um, so that's Lighthouse Park. Starts at 9 a.m. Uh, goes to 12 every single day um, all fall in, into December. We'll be opening other ways that you can get involved. We'll be um, opening a speaker series um, in in the future to the community. So um, if you connect with us, we can we can put you on a, a mailing list for that. And we have field trips throughout Connecticut. And if you if you visit New Haven Bird Club, um, org, you can and go to calendar, you can see all the things that that we have coming up. And, um, and they're free and, and open to everyone. So um, I hope you will uh, consider joining us because we would love to have you. Um, we're always interested in in talking about uh, birds and and talking about uh, what we know and uh, and sharing observations with new people. We're super friendly. We're five. There's 500 people um, in the club, so there's lots of lots of people to get to know. 
Um, and again, if you're um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, the book Fickety Tales, um, please uh, reach out to um, uh, to Kim about that. So, um, so that's my uh, introduction to the book, and um, I'm going to pass it over to John Triana, who's going to take you through some of the the origin story of the New Haven um, Bird Club, and this is uh, based on his uh, an essay that he contributed substantially to that is featured um, in the book. So I pass it over to my colleague, uh, John. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gail. Uh, I, just to introduce myself again, as Gail and Kim mentioned, my name is John Tran. I'm historian for the New Haven Bird Club. And as uh, Kim mentioned, I started on this uh, road when I was the president of the club from uh, well, the centennial was in 2007, but uh, I started working on the history about two years before that, about 2005. And let me start sharing a screen and get underway. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, as I said, I was the president in at the centennial, and uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to meet tons of really interesting and cool people uh, and hear stories that I had one uh, librarian uh, the name of uh, Jean Lowry, who was the librarian at Bishopwood School in New Haven, who was into genealogy. So she helped me tremendously track down descendants of some of our charter members. I was really trying to fill in the picture for who was here at the start of the New Haven Bird Club. And it created, there were some mysteries already, the research created other mysteries, and a lot of times I was able to solve and answer the mysteries, the questions. So one of the first ones is kind of related to the logo, as you see here, it says established 1907, and we had always known that our first meeting at our inception, we, we were founded on April 3rd, 1907. But the first mystery I'll tell you is something that happened before that. So what you're looking at is a page out of bird lore, which was the magazine or journal for the National Audubon Society, and they would put in bird lore in, in January and February, a, an accounting of all the Christmas bird counts that happened in the previous December. So this is the bird lore edition from January and February 1907, and the, this little paragraph that says, New Haven, Connecticut, an effort was made by five members of the New Haven Bird Club to cover the best sections of bird country in and about New Haven. Well, if you're doing the timeline timeline right here, then they're talking about the Christmas bird count of 1906. If we're not founded until April 3rd, 1907, how is our name appearing here? Well, in the account here, you could see that it was five different uh, guys in five different places. The first one was Edgewood Park in Mitchell's Hill done by Clifford Pangburn. Then there was East Haven and Lake Solmstall done by Erdis Saunders. West Rock Park, and I think that's supposed to be Wintergreen Gap, not Sap, but I, I could be wrong, done by Dwight Pangburn. Uh, New Haven to West Haven, done by Albert Honeywell, and Prospect Hill to Pine Rock, done by Bernard Lee. Well, as I mentioned, Gene helped me a lot with uh, genealogy and tracking down descendants, and one of the people she hooked me up with was Elizabeth Horgan, who is the daughter of Albert Honeywell. She lived in Weathersfield and her brother lived in Pennsylvania. She, I corresponded with her, she was super nice. And uh, I asked about her father's materials. Did he have anything from uh, when he was really into birds? And she said, yes, it's down in my brother's barn in Pennsylvania, we'll, we'll bring it up for you so you can see it. So she invited me up to her house in Weathersfield and let me look through all his bird materials. And there was tons of stuff on a couple of folding tables in the basement. And it was through that that this first mystery gets solved. So amongst the things that were in Albert Honeywell's collection was this, which is, as you see from the title at the very top, but maybe too small to read, says Constitution of the New Haven Bird Club. Well, I read this. It was all done handwritten, as you can see. And then there were definitely points in here that were never part of any of our constitutions or bylaws. I mean, I read everything that we had from 1907 and thereafter. And some things were just clearly not from our organization 
such as in the small print here, section two, any person who has seen 75 different species of wild birds during one year. Well, we never had a bird observation limit for our membership. So what does this all mean? And then I flipped it over and what does it have here? It has A.A. A. Saunders and his mark, A.W. Honeywell and his mark, C.H. Pangborn and his mark, and D.B. Pangburn and his mark. And what you then come to see is that these four guys, along with the other one who was mentioned in bird law, who was Bernard Lee, he's not on this uh, constitution, but the, his picture's up at the top. These five guys were students in the New Haven school system and then matriculated on to Yale uh, just after that. So uh, they either went to New Haven High School or uh, Boardman Training School. And they created something that they called the New Haven Bird Club, at least in 1907, because not only was there that, but there was also this in Albert's uh, materials, the field, field notebook of 1906 by A.W. Honeywell. And then it says vice president in quote, quotations, New Haven Bird Club. There it is in 1906. And he was also president of the New Haven High School Nature Club. So here we've answered sort of the question that how was there a New Haven Bird Club before there was a New Haven Bird Club? And it was because these high school kids, these guys, created a New Haven Bird Club in New Haven High School. And we knew that from, again, from our modern understanding of when we started, here's our original book of minutes. And you can see the page from that first, uh, from the meeting where we started the New Haven Bird Club was April 3rd, 1907. It does say there are minutes of the second regular meeting because there was a sort of preliminary get to know you, get organized meeting in the end of March. But it was in the April 3rd meeting where they really came up with the constitution, came up with the name, they came up with officers and so forth. And that's when we call ourselves as founded in April 3rd of 1907. So we know that at that meeting, it was at one of the YMCA's in New Haven. There was a couple of YMCA's. I don't know exactly if it was the one in this postcard, but I'm gonna say that it is. And we'll go with that and they elected officers. So what you see here are four of the five officers, one Phil with Buttrick, I'll talk about him in a little bit. Uh, he was actually a high school student at the time that he was elected treasurer. But the four people that you see left to right here are Edgar Stiles, who was the president, Alfred Kedzie, who was vice president, Estelle uh, Greist, who was the corresponding secretary. And here is Eridus Saunders, who was the recording secretary. So we see him again. He's on that transition from the old, the original New Haven Bird Club to the existing one. So we don't know. There, there's no indication about how the name got transferred. Was it just co-opted by the adults or did the, the guys just freely give it to them or suggest that that would be the name? We don't know. That is not recorded in the minutes at all. So in the, that first book of minutes, we have a list of what we call our charter members. And there's 61 that you see on this list here. And there are actually at least four different lists of charter members. Not all of them agree. Sometimes people are added in one list and they don't show up in another. Other times the spelling's a little different from one to the other. So through my research in 2005 to 2007, I tried to go through everything and tried to figure out who is who and who is actually a charter member. I came up with these it's really 59 people who are charter members, then two honorary members, which I'll talk about in a second. And we don't know, there's no definition of what an, our charter member actually was. Was it all, were, did you have to be at that meeting on April 3rd or did you have to uh, pay your dues by a certain date, maybe by June or by December? We don't know, that's not defined, but it is, there are lists of these charter members. One is in the original minutes, one's in a newspaper article from 1934, there's a 1937 newspaper article and then there's a 1954 newspaper article. So this is the best that we can come up with. But the two people who were honorary members of the club one of them was the first name on that list is John Burroughs, the famous uh, wildlife uh, author. And why he became an honorary member is because the members knew that April 3rd was his 70th birthday in 1907. And there had been a recent note in the newspaper saying that he was ill recently. So the members at the first meeting said to Estelle Grice, the corresponding secretary, can you write a letter to John Burroughs and invite him to be an honorary member. We'd like to wish him well and invite him to the club. So she uh, penned off a letter and, off went and he wrote back saying that he would be happy to become an honorary member and he became as such. 
The second honorary member is Donald G. Mitchell. Now, if you're familiar with this name, you might know it because the library in Westville is named after him. And although his, except for that, his name doesn't echo a lot in New Haven, during the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s, he would have been a well-known guy. He uh, was originally from around the Norwich, New London area and came to Yale. And then he was an author, put out many books. His uh, pen name was, I'm not sure if it was Ike or Ike Marvel. And he owned a huge estate in Westville. It went all the way from the present day Edward Park up to where Hopkins is. His house where he's sitting in that chair is still there today. It's now uh, carved up into several different apartments. But then he owned where Hopkins is and all the way back to where the Yale golf, golf, golf course currently is. And that was Mitchell's Hill. Remember in that uh, Christmas bird count listing, one of the places that one of the guys went was Mitchell's Hill. That was it. And he also called his farm there Marvelwood, you know, taking off from his uh, pseudonym uh, pen name there for Ick Marvel. So they were, all the members were very appreciative. They did many walks up on Mitchell's Hill, and so they made him an honorary member at that time. Just a couple more words about the president of our organization at the time, Edgar Stiles. If you're familiar with his name, especially if you're from West Haven, you would recognize it as the name of one of the schools in town from 1931 to uh, just recently, I think it was finally decommissioned. Uh, Edgar Stiles was originally from Hartford, and then he went to Yale and uh, was class of 1886. He went into teaching. Uh, he served in the school systems for Seymour and Norwalk, but he eventually made it and settled down in West Haven in 1898, became the superintendent of schools, and he remained the superintendent of schools for West Haven until his death in 1933. So the school was actually built and named for him two years before his death when he was still actively working as the uh, West Haven superintendent. A couple more things, as I said, this is, uh, he was a class of 1886 in Yale, which you see is, is his 1886 photograph from Yale. And on the right is a photograph him, of him from his 30 year record in 1916. Well, in the club, one of those other uh, charter members was a woman by the name of Edna Morgan. She was originally from New Hampshire, and she taught at West Haven High. Well, uh, in, in 1908, they become married, and uh, uh, she was uh, she was very active in the club along with him. And one of the coolest things that we have are some of her field notes in, in our archives. Are, and she had a very distinct handwriting. You can't mistake it for anything else. But having those notes as anyone who's into science and keeping, uh, you know, sort of records of how things change, th those kinds of notes are invaluable. Well, during the first year, they definitely knew that they wanted to have a publication, put out a publication. And so they got a committee together to make the first publication for the New Haven Bird Club called List of the Birds of the New Haven Region. Now, it wasn't just a, a, a checklist where things were just listed species and when you might see them. It was a little bit more than that, had a little bit more meat where it described some of the places where you would go to observe birds in the New Haven area. In fact, some of the ones that Gail mentioned like Lighthouse Point Park and East Rock Park are included in there. And then it gave a little, little uh, vignette or a little note about each one of the birds that you could see uh, in the New Haven area. But the what I'm gonna talk about here are some of the people who were involved in this publication because uh, I, I like to try to, uh, in, in those early years, I was really trying to fill in the, the blanks and, and learn more about those charter members. So Freeman Burr, Phil Buttrick, uh, Alfred Hill, it says here, but that we know that is incorrect. His name is Albert uh, Honeywell, I should say. Uh, Dwight Pangburn, Erida Saunders, and Dwight's older brother, Clifford Pangburn, and then an advisory committee of Dr. Lewis Bishop. So let's talk about them for a second. So as I mentioned, Albert Honeywell uh, was from New Haven and he matriculated on to Yale. He went to the Sheffield School at Yale. And if you're not familiar with what the Sheffield School was, so there was Yale College or Yale University, and then there was the Sheffield School. And if you were going to be a banker or uh, a lawyer or a teacher, you know, teach English or something like that, then you went to Yale University. But if you were going to go into the applied sciences, so you were going to be a minor, a biologist, a chemist, or an engineer, you went to the Sheffield School. And while Yale was a four-year program, the Sheffield School was a three-year program. So Albert graduated from New Haven High School in 1907, and then he got his degree from the Sheffield School in 1910. And he was in the engineering department. And 
in the 1910 Sheffield School book, what do you see? There's his picture and a little vignette for him next to it. What is he doing? It shows him hanging upside down from a tree branch, taking pictures of birds. I don't think that was ironic there. I think that there's a clue about his, what his interests were outside of Yale at that time. If you look down at the lower left-hand corner of the screen, that is a picture of what says Acadian owl. We would call it a stalwart owl now. And that picture actually appeared in an edition of the AUK, which was the Journal of the American Ornithologist Unit. Up at the top right, you see his certificate from the AOU. A lot of the early charter members went on and joined the AOU, including uh, Albert here. And then you see some of his sketching of some birds that were in his collection in that uh, Elizabeth's basement in Wethersfield. But by leaps and bounds, in my opinion anyway, the coolest thing in his collection was this, which was a tiny little program book for the New Haven Bird Club for the 1909-1910 year. Now there's no record of us producing or anyone producing this in the minutes. So when I saw this, this was all new to me. It's actually about uh, five inches by three inches and it's bound by these two little ribbons, these delicate little ribbons, it has a picture of a uh, rose-breasted grosbeak nest on the front. Excuse me, and the, the book itself was a listing of the indoor programs that they were gonna have that year. Well, a guy who was very good friends with Albert and would, you know, went along with him on everything was Dwight Pangburn. And why I say that is that because Dwight Pangburn was the same age, graduated from New Haven High School in 1907. And then he went on to the Sheffield School, majored in engineering, just like Albert. And then when you look in their class yearbook, there's a picture of the engineering class for 1910 of the Sheffield School. And Dwight is back here. And Albert is on the other side of the big gear wheel there. Well, uh, Dwight uh, was uh, went into engineering for motorcycles, actually, and was employed at the Indian Motorcycle Company up in Springfield. And there's some account in his Yale records of him taking a motorcycle drive across the country, went from Springfield to Buffalo and then out to Kansas City and back. Um, Dwight, however, did not have uh, great health. He was uh, afflicted by diabetes. So while his uh, brother went on to World War I, and I'll mention that, he passed away by uh, 1917 as a, as a young man. And his, I think he was about uh, 26 or 27 years old at that time. His older brother, Clifford Pangburn, uh, was also one of the people who put together all the information for our first publication. And he went to Yale University itself. So he was in that class of uh, 1910. But, and one of Clifford's real uh, notable things that he participated in, I think it was over 40 different Christmas bird counts. You saw the one that I showed you earlier from 1906. Well, here's one from 1916. And we know that, and it includes, what does it include? What, what we're talking about before, Edgewood Park and Mitchell's Hill. There's Donald Mitchell's uh, property or old property. He, had, he was deceased by this time. But uh, we know that he uh, volunteered for World War I, went over there in the American Expeditionary Force and drove ambulances for a while. Now, in his Yale records, there's no indication that he was wounded there. I think he probably just had an accident and somehow got injured. So he comes back to uh, the United States, to New Haven. And the coolest thing about his Christmas bird count uh, records is what happened in 1917 which is shown below, proving that you can participate in a Christmas bird count anywhere, anytime. You just have to have at least a window. So this is his 1917 Christmas bird count list, uh, listing uh, count. New Haven, Connecticut, from a window of the New Haven Hospital, December 25th, snowing, well, wind, north, light, temperature 30. He saw one downy woodpecker and three starlings. So he saw two species in total with four individuals, Clifford H. Pangbird. So he kept his streak going there even though he was infirmed in the New Haven Hospital in 1917. Well, one of the people who was uh, who Marjorie, Hilton, I'm sorry, who Jean helped me track down was one of Clifford's granddaughters, Marjorie, Dr. Marjorie McCracken from California. And she supplied me with numerous photographs of her grandfather and her great uh, uncle. And what you see on the left-hand side is Clifford and Dwight, probably from around 1907, 19, 1900, excuse me, or maybe a, a little bit earlier than that in the 19, uh, in the 1890s. And then you see a picture of him and his wife at their last house in St. Augustine, Florida. He actually would invite people down as sort of a B&B &B kind of come down and then go boarding. 
kind of thing. And there's actually a, a letter from Alfred in the 1940s inviting Bird Club members to come down to his house in St. Augustine. Well, as I mentioned, Clifford was a very patriotic guy. Not only did he serve in World War I, but he also served in World War II. Well, as you can imagine, and also you see from the photograph that he was an older man by the time you get to World War II, but that was not a problem because what he did was he was a writer and he worked in advertising and wrote magazine articles. So what he did in World War II is he uh, wrote manuals. He came up with manuals for the Army and the Air Force. And as you can imagine, for someone with such a uh, great military pedigree, where would you expect that he is interred? It is that he chose as his final resting place, Arlington National Cemetery, and you can visit him down there uh, next time that you uh, visit. Another guy who was you know, on this committee for the first publication is Philip Buttrick. He was a, a year younger than um, uh, Dwight and Albert. Uh, he graduated from New Haven High School in 1908, but then he went on to the Sheffield School, but he didn't study engineering, he studied forestry. He became a forester. And he also, just like Clifford, when World War II, World War I broke out, he volunteered and went over to the American Expeditionary Force. You, you see him in his uniform driving a Red Cross ambulance over there. But that was not sufficient for Philip. He wanted to get into the action, get closer to it. So he joined a unit that was uh, of a unit of the French army that was made up of only non-French citizens who were rejected by their respective country's armies. And uh, so he was in a French artillery unit for the rest of the war and earned the Croix de Guerre after all his service in World War I. After he came back, he would teach places like uh, University of Georgia and Michigan State. And he was also the first secretary forester for the Connecticut Forestry Association, uh, Connecticut Forestry Association which we would now know as the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. And he wrote many manuals and books on forestry topics. As you can see here, this is one about our state flower and uh, went on uh, to do a lot of work in forestry uh, throughout his life. Another guy who also went into the forestry school of the Sheffield, uh, of Yale's Sheffield School was Eridus Saunders. And he was not just a forester, but he was really an all around naturalist. He uh, wrote many books in particular for birds. He wrote books on bird songs and he came up with one of the first graphical ways to depict a bird song. Well, uh, he would come and he talked to the bird club about some of his uh, methods all through the years. And uh, he also went, actually, let me go back. I, I, let me go that way. Okay, sorry. Uh, he, after he was, he worked in the forest service in places like Montana and Alabama. And then he came back to work in education around here. So the first job that he got, he was a science teacher at West Haven High School. Probably not surprising, I would guess that he probably got the job through Edgar Stiles. After he was only there for a year or two, then he went on to teach science at Bridgeport Central High School and worked there for many, many years. And I spoke to a couple of his students who were inspired by his teaching back then and went into different fields of biology on their own for their careers. The adult who ran the whole thing was a guy named Freeman Foster Burr. And as you can probably tell from why all the other guys were Yale guys, here's a book that Freeman wrote. He used a different color. He was a Harvard guy. I don't know if that's a tell or not, but the reason why he was in New Haven at the time is he taught at the state normal school. So if you don't know normals, what normal schools were, they were universities that taught teachers. And he was teaching there at the time and he sort of uh, helped organize the group of the high school and uh, college kids to put it together our first uh, edition. The guy who was the advisor committee was Dr. Lewis Bishop. Now there was uh, hands down, Dr. Bishop was the biggest name in ornithology in the club for the charter members. And he was a medical doctor, but he gave it all up in 1907, 1908 to focus exclusively on ornithology. Now, he comes from the old school of ornithology where you weren't using what they called back then field glasses and you weren't using binoculars or a scope. You were, you were not observing birds. You were going out there and collecting birds. So he, would, he did ornithology by the gun, not by the binocular. And uh, he amassed a huge collection of study skins. I mean, this was the, the thing that they did in the 1800s. That's how you did ornithology. 
And uh, at the end of his life, his study skin collection numbered over 53,000. Now he didn't shoot them all himself. He accumulated many other people's collections. So, you know, Mr. Smith over here, everybody collected birds that way. And he, had, Mr. Smith would have a study skin collection of 150 birds. And once Mr. Smith wanted to get rid of his collection, he would be talking to Dr. Bishop and Dr. Bishop would say, yeah, I'll buy it from you. And he added to his collection in that manner. Well, Mr. Bishop, uh, Dr. Bishop was very generous with all his collection. And we had many uh, club meetings at his birdhouse off of Orange Street in New Haven. And by 1922, he moves to California in Pasadena, but stays up with the bird club. Uh, and I'll get to more about Dr. Bishop in a little bit. Some photographs of him on his uh, expedition in South Dakota, where he was collecting birds and eggs. The skin collection of about 53,000, most of those went to the Field Museum in Chicago upon his death, and most of the egg collection went to the Yale Peabody Museum. What you see here, here are his Yale School photograph from his class in 1886. So he is the same Yale class as Edgar Stiles, and then his 30-year record photograph in 1916. Another thing, not only was, I mean, Dr. Bishop was the biggest name in ornithology, like I said at the time, he was already a fellow of the AOU. So he had uh, matriculated up the hierarchy in the American Ornithologist Union at that time. And by 1913, he's one of the co-authors of the State Natural History Survey of the Birds of Connecticut with John Hall Sage and Walter Parks Bliss. Now, not a charter member, but an early member of the club. By 1908, there's a minister living in uh, West Haven called named Herbert, uh, I'm sorry, named uh, Herbert Job. And he not only was an, a minister, later on, he would be one of the first Connecticut state ornithologists. He would work for National Audubon, amongst others. But his big contribution to ornithology was that he was a pioneer in bird photography. He wrote books on the subject uh, and, and just birding in general. But he really did a lot of photography of birds in the early days late 1800s, early 1900s. He also was a Harvard guy, so he was a good friend of the former president at this time, Teddy Roosevelt. In fact, if you go online, you, you Google it for Herbert K. Job, um, you know, birding film, bird films or something like that. I believe it's the National Archives uh, repository online. You could see one of his films from, I think it was 1916, of where he went on a birding expedition with Theodore Roosevelt, the former president, down to Louisiana. So it's a bunch of uh, shots of birds and Teddy Roosevelt, birds and Teddy Roosevelt, but actually he shows himself. So there's a little uh, just short video clip of Herbert Job in, the, uh, in that clip, if you can find it. Another big part of our early years where we you know, really planted our, our flag in, in the ground was in the uh, program of bird banding, which you see here is a uh, photograph of a guy named Leon J. Cole. And he, in 1901, gave a talk to the AOU about coming up with this systematic bird banding program where you can put little metal bands on birds that's wherever you find them. And then hopefully you'd find them at another location so you can determine something about their migration pattern. Well, after giving that talk to the AOU, it really didn't go anywhere. I think there was one guy in Michigan who kind of flirted with the idea, but it, it didn't take off. But he comes to Yale in 1907, 1908, and he talks about the same idea to the willing, uh, open-minded audience of the New Haven Bird Club. And we decide to take it on as our own. So we come up with a collection. We make a sh uh, uh, the committee the, to do this was Clifford Pangburn, which who you met, it was Dr. Bishop who you met, and then Leon J. Cole. And they come up with this uh, program and rec they make records about capturing birds, and putting the little bands on their, on their legs, and then releasing them to hopefully find them in another location. Well, the, their efforts were underwhelming in the first year, and they, they hoped that they could do more, but they just didn't have the the manpower and the wherewithal. So by 1909, now they start talking to the American Museum of Natural History and they take all their records and their program and they kind of hand it off to the American Museum of Natural History and then they bring it to the greater audience. 
So you can say in a, in a real sense that we started bird banning as a systemic program, and then uh, it became what it is today, which is done all over the world. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a, in a bit, but it has always been a great source of information and data to learn about the migration patterns of birds. And to sort of uh, emphasize this point, here's a photograph that appeared in the New Haven Register of Mrs. Frank Hubbard, her, her name was May, May Hubbard, with bird trap, which she uses to catch birds, which are then banded and released. So this, I believe, article is from 1934, and she lived in Westville, I think it was on McKinley Street. Well, one of the other great trees that was actually through the New Haven Museum's Whitney Library was of this guy who you see here, which his name is Ernest Coe. And of the list of charter members, Ernest and his wife Anna were there, but they disappeared off of our membership rolls in the mid 20s and I didn't know what happened to them. I didn't see any more records of them in the minutes or anywhere else. So I you know, thought it was all uh, lost. And then when I was in the Whitney Library one day, uh, credit to Jim uh, Campbell and his wife, librarians at the time, uh, they showed me how to you know, go through all the records. And in the records for the Dana collection, there's an index file card there. And it said, uh, just a notation, Ernest Co. Obituary, Miami, I think it was 1951. So I was like, well, let me see if this is anything. I don't know if this is my guy or not. You know, I, I didn't know if he was in Florida. Uh, that would be news to me, but let me see if it's him. So with Jim and Bonnie, I look up the Dana collection and I found this obituary. So uh, I, let me, I got to move my screen a little bit so I can read it for you here. Uh, so it says, Mr. Ernest Code dies at Miami. And you see the date there, January 2nd, 1951. So I start reading Mr. Ernest F. Coe, 84, father of the movement, which established Florida's Everglade National Park died yesterday in a hospital after a short illness. And I started thinking, wait a second, this can't be my guy. Keep reading. He devoted about 20 years of his life to making the Everglades America's newest and third largest national park. It was dedicated in December 1947 by President Truman. I'm like, you got to be kidding. I mean, this can't be the guy that I'm looking for, is it? And then you get down towards the bottom and it says, here we go. Coe was born in New Haven, Connecticut, March 21st, 1866, and was graduated from Yale University School of Fine Arts in 1887, he came to Miami in 1925 with his wife and settled in suburban Coconut Grove. So now that proves to me that this is my guy. This is the guy who left the New Haven area, dip it, disappears from our roles in the mid-1920s. This is why he goes down to Florida. And when he goes down there, he falls in love with the River of Grass, the Everglades, and he starts a campaign to make it into uh, America's national park that you see today. So now once I knew who I was looking for and had some more information, you can find all sorts of information on Ernest F. Coe. So here's some pictures of him later in life uh, after he had uh, the, National, uh, the National Park had been established. And if you go down to Everglades National Park today and you enter the visitor center at the beginning of uh, the entrance of the park, you will be visiting the Ernest F. Coe Visitor Center at the Everglades National Park. So this was a, a huge, cool story that came out of the research in uh, around the centennial time. So now we're up to 1929. We come up with our second uh, publication. This was just a really just a checklist of birds of the New Haven area. And it was just a listing. There was nothing else to it. So it was pretty Spartan in, in that respect. But we were still active in the 1920s. In the middle of the Depression, actually, we started work to try to create our own or try to um, by our own sanctuary. So one of our members had land. It was on the eastern side of New Haven. I could never figure out exactly where this was, but it was either in the annex or up by uh, Fox and area somewhere. And we started a fund to try to buy, raise money to buy the sanctuary. And these pictures appeared in our yearbook, which was published annually. And we'll give a list of our members and the talks that we were going to have and the walks that we were going to have each year. And in the middle of the depression, I think she wanted, what I saw in the minutes was she wanted about $5,000. We can only get to 3,000 and change. And then we just said, okay, we're never gonna get there. It was now 1932. So we, we gave up the effort. And there was this little funny note in the uh, minutes that says, Mr. James, who was the, one of the presidents at the time or around this time, showed us another bird, which Mr. Shepard 
found dead at the sanctuary. Mr. Shipper said that Bird probably committed suicide because we were not taking over the sanctuary. That was from the May, the May 5th, 1932 minutes. Well, by the early 1930s now, we really reach a crossroads, a, a milestone for the New Haven Bird Club. At this point, a lot of our charter members had left the area or had passed on. Uh, those biggest names uh, that I mentioned, like Edgar Siles, he was the longest running president. He was president for well over 20 years. And uh, he had passed on in 1933, as well as uh, Herbert Job and uh, Mrs. Tulloch, who was an, another president of the Bird Club. And we now transition into the next phase, so to speak. But what's cool is that we had in 1937, a 30-year anniversary banquet. And at that time, Ms. Dr. Bishop is in Pasadena, but he writes an essay back to the club to be read at that 30th anniversary banquet. And I always love reading this because it's from Dr. Bishop's own words. So it comes straight from a guy who was there at the uh, birth of our bird club. And uh, if you indulge me for a couple minutes, I'll read it because it, it tells you the background from someone who had firsthand knowledge of all this stuff. So Lewis B. Bishop, Pasadena, March, 20, March 10th, 1937. In all man does, there seems to be a, there seems to occur a certain curiosity. And this is true for the study of ornithology as well as other matters. Perhaps that is the reason that in New Haven near the middle of the first decade of the century, there arose a group of young men greatly interested in birds. You'll find their names printed in the list of the birds of the New Haven region. Bulletin number one of the New Haven Bird Club printed in May, 1908. Philip L. Buttrick, Alfred, we know that's wrong, Albert W. Jr., Dwight D. and Clifford H. Pangburn, and Eridus A. Saunders. These are the names printed on as the committee on compilation. They are the ones to whom the merit of this list is due. The chairman, Freeman F. Burr, and the author of this sketch doing little but lend our names and in some cases our experience. Through the initiative and enthusiasm of these young men, the formation of the New Haven Bird Club came and a large part of its its success during the early years of its existence, beginning in the spring of 1907. Besides these boys, a number of young women, largely teachers in the New Haven schools or students in the normal school, gave a willing audience at the meetings or wandered about the country studying birds. But had it not been for the continued enthusiasm of these young men and genuine interest in birds and their lives soon acquired by many of the young women, this and like so many similar organizations would soon have withered away. Even with all this sustained enthusiasm, this might still have been the case, but for the devotion and skill that guided the club in its early years. Edgar C. Stiles, head of the West Haven Schools, presided, presiding most faithfully as president for many years, held the club to its aims, and, Mrs., and Miss Martha L. Sandmeyer, who acted long and efficient and able secretary, deserved the perpetual remembrance of the club for their faithfulness and devotion. And Reverend Herbert K. Joe and Mrs. Gilbert Tullock must not be forgotten. The former living then in West Haven, though most of his valuable scientific work was done and the majority of his unrivaled pictures of avian life made elsewhere, was a, huge, was a regular attendant, always ready to talk. And Mrs. Tullock was a tower of strength to the organization, always ready to undertake any duty and an earnest student of birds. But no matter how fine the officers and how enthusiastic the members, a sustained interest in the subject that will let no trouble interfere with their study was necessary those formative years, and this the members had. Devotion that will collect a, a crowd of young people at 5 a.m. on spring mornings in the country to observe and study birds and bring them week after week in the kind of interest this, that's, that counts and that they had. We knew that soon after sunrise during the migration Birds were easiest to find, and also many of the birds had, uh, many of the students had other duties that day. And at this season, for several years, some of the members used to meet me at this hour, and we would wander through the fields and woods seeking birds until about half past seven. Similarly, such classes were led by others at similar hours, but a new method in the study of ornithology had, arid, had risen at the time uh, the New Haven Bird Club was formed. A method to which I was not accustomed, and in whose accuracy and reliability I had little faith. All those interested in, in the study of birds before had been collectors. Those who formed this club were simply observers, and the accuracy and investigation shown by their notes in the birds of the New Haven region 
which they read to me for suggestions before printing were to me surprising. But with those who accompanied me in the field, I used the plan of first showing them the bird, thus allowing them to study its characters in the tree, and then shooting it, if it seemed advisable, that they might study it at close hand and thus fix it firmly in memory. None of the birds were wasted and probably no reduction in nesting occasion, but these young people were able to connect what they saw with the, with the glasses with what they held in the hand. And I still believe no record of a bird out of its normal range is valuable without shooting unless the reporter is familiar with the bird in its natural habitat and has handled the bird at close range. Among those studying at Yale was Leon J. Cole, now a well-known and able professor of genetics or similar subject at a Midwestern University. And through his initiative, the New Haven Bird Club has the glory of starting system, systematic bird banding in the United States. And he went on for a few more pages to talk about ornithology in New Haven even before that. But uh, Dr. Bishop's uh, letter back to the club in 1937 is an important landmark because it provides us a clear vision on what the foundation was in 1907. Well, as we come out of that time, uh, we are still doing stuff and still run by people who were New Haven guys who then went on to Yale. This guy's named Harold Hutchins, and he went to the Sheffield School, but he was now neither a, a forester nor an engineer. As you can see from his little vignette here, he was a chemist. And he also banded birds. So one day he and some others went to the um, chimney at the New Haven Hospital and banded many chimney swifts. Uh, well, we don't know, don't know how many he banded on that day, but it was several. And what happened is that several chimney swifts were captured down in the Amazon jungle and their bands were then recorded and the data returned back, excuse me, to the United States, which helped understand some of the chimney swifts migration patterns, which you can see in this article. Now, the New Haven Bird Club has definitely been a beneficiary of having the close proximity of a world-renowned university in, in, in its in, it, in the city where it resides. And that is definitely true also from the Yale Peabody Museum. What you see here is a staff photograph from the uh, Peabody Museum. And in it are several members and some presidents of the Bird Club. What you see here in, in yellow is uh, Stanley Ball, who also went to Yale and was a uh, biologist. There is Gertrude Clark, who was the head of the children's programming at Yale at the time. I, I don't know if I said that this, I believe this, Photograph of the either staff photograph from 1928 or 29. Thomas James, born in England, he's also a curator at the Peabody Museum, would also be a president of the Bird Club. And finally, another president was Percy Morris. Now, opposed to the other people who had college backgrounds, Percy Morris was from the Valley. He grew up in Seymour, and I could not find any evidence that he ever went to college, but he was a great naturalist and was a curator at the Yale Peabody Museum. He was really an all around naturalist, but one of his specialties was shells. And he was actually the author of the first Peterson Field Guide for shells. And even you know, 40 years after his death, he was still listed as one of the co-authors for, for that uh, Peterson Field Guide. And uh, again, these photographs come from the Peabody Museum, as well as his daughter, Marion Rassey from uh, Illinois, who was very, generous with all her information, the stories of her dad and pictures of him as well. Another guy who was a member at that time who's actually pretty important for conservation in the area was a fellow by the name of George Cromie. Now he was a Canadian, came down to the Yale School of Forestry and worked as the tree superintendent for New Haven, also did some tree work for Yale and then would be a state forester. Well, as he was working in these jobs, he would also be buying some raw land up that was just forested around New Haven. Some of it was around the Cheshire Bethany Prospect Line and, and Hamden where all the, those four towns come together. Another was a bunch of woodland that was out by uh, Guilford and he eventually sold it to the state and they became parts of Concaponset State Forest and Naugatuck State Forest. So what you see here are the woodlots of George Cromie and this line up here, this is actually Route 42 and the Mount Stanford block of the Naugatuck State Forest is mostly the land that was sold by George uh, Cromie 
to the state for Noctec State Forest. Also, uh, in that time, 1950s, uh, a woman who was involved very active in the in the early parts of the 20th century was Lena J. Gorham. Now, she was a school teacher, taught at Edgewood School, and she mainly did the younger grades, like kindergarten and first grade. And uh, she put together like a, a bunch of books where members could loan. She also, we know from some of her students who were alive back in 2005 and 2007, that she would take some of her students out to Edgewood Park and do bird walks with them. Well, she dies in 1951 and her sister, who was also a teacher in the New Haven school system, Myrtle, then donates a large sum of money to the bird club and creates the Lena J. Gorham uh, Speakers Bureau. And we would bring letters for birds and ornithology to speak to the club for many years for the Lena J. Gorham Memorial Lecture including like the only time that Roger uh, uh, Tory Peterson ever talked to the New Haven Bird Club was through her speakers fund. Another guy who was around in the 90s and uh, would be, I don't know if you call him the head of the Peabody Museum, but he's one of the heads, I, I guess you'd say, was S. Dylan Ripley. And he started the Peabody Museum, a member of the club, of the uh, association and have some buy-in. Well, after he, he left the Peabody Museum, he found uh, another place in Washington that was also pretty well known. You might have heard of it called the Smithsonian Institution. And he was the head of the Smithsonian Institution for 20 years from about 1964 uh, when he left the Peabody Museum to about 1984. At the time, there's a student at Yale who's in the Fine Arts uh, College that is putting together an essay on observing birds in the New Haven region. His name was John Cameron Yarazari. And Percy Morris gets wind of this project that he's working on for some class and he reviews it. He says to the club, hey, you know, this is something that would be really interesting. We should look at publishing this for the club. And he convinces everybody and this becomes our third publication. So in 1956, the Observing Birds in the New Haven region by John Cameron Yarazari. Uh, hits the uh, hits the street, and John Cameron Yurizari would illustrate many field guides throughout his life, including birds, reptiles, mammals. And in 2006, he was one of the people who came back and spoke to us during our centennial year. Now, once you get out of the 1950s, you really sort of hit the modern era. We, uh, in some respects, you hear from some of our older members talking about how in the 40s and 50s, a lot of uh, older women in white tennis shoes who were going out there, they weren't really serious. But when you hit 1960, 1959, we start doing things that you would see us doing today. One of it is we start redoing the Christmas bird count, which drops off of our list of activities in the 1930s. We start doing that again in the late 50s and 1960. And also another guy who was very important to us was one of our presidents at that time. And some of you may know him. And this is Tony Casenza. And he was the head naturalist at the West Rock Nature Center. He uh, really put that place together, became uh, the New Haven Park that it was flourished in the 1960s and 70s and had kids, you know, they put together the, and, and built this park for kids and had many uh, animals there, including a, a mountain lion at one time, including you know, more common stuff like raccoons and uh, deer. And what you see here is a uh, bird cage that a couple of owls were caged in that were given by uh, funds that the New Haven Bird Club donated to the West Rock Nature Center. Well, not only do we start doing things like other things during his tenure as president, like a backyard bird count it was instituted in the early 1960s, but his wife becomes our first newsletter editor. So before September 1963, we did not have a regular way to interact with our membership, you would have to come to one of the meetings or one of the walks in order to interact with us. Virginia Casenza was our first newsletter editor, and she was, again, fantastic to talk to uh, when I was doing the research in the mid-2000s. In this photograph, you see a guy who would be the uh, Bird Club president in the mid-60s, Richard English, and to his right are his parents, Philip and Catherine English. Now, the Englishes were well known and well-established in Connecticut and New Haven. They are a New Haven family that goes back decades, centuries. Uh, 
he has Connecticut governors on both sides of his family tree here. You are also looking at the first three life members of the New Haven Bird Club. When Philip and Catherine were members in the 20s or 30s, when their two sons, James and Richard were born, they made them junior members. So Richard has the longest tenured membership of, he has the longest membership of anyone that spans about 60 years. And uh, Richard, you know, gave much to the club. Uh, not only would he lead walks, but for many, many years, not only was he the, the president, but he also would come to the indoor meetings and he would lead our observations of what people were seeing in the field for the last month. So he would be up there tell you what he saw down at Lighthouse or at or, uh, Edgewood Park or East Rock. And then he would call out to the members so that you can chime in with what you saw on your way to work or what you saw in your backyard. So Richard was a uh, stalwart of the club for many, many years. He passed in 2011. And as you can imagine from a guy who was, whose family was so interconnected with the city of New Haven, in, uh, at, the, at his passing in his will, he gave the greatest, largest donation to the Community Foundation of New Haven. At that time, I think it still is, $20 million went to the foundation to give back what uh, the city gave to his family. Also in the 60s, we start coming up and doing more and more lists. Uh, well, this guy is Noble Proctor. Maybe some of you knew him or had him as a teacher. He taught biology at Southern Connecticut and many of his students were inspired by his teaching, his knowledge and vast wealth of numerous natural history topics, not just birds, and went into various biological disciplines themselves. At around this time, also after Richard becomes the, the president, then the next president uh, was, uh, was George Letus, and he's in this photograph with his wife, Millie, and many people would tell you at the time that Millie was the really bigger birder, and George really took on birding as a, a sort of a, a way to see his wife. And in order, if he wanted to see his wife, he had to pick up birding, and that's what he did. And he was a guy who, when, when you look at his background or what he did for a living, uh, he was a developer, he was not someone who you would think would be very much interested in conservation. But one thing that developers do is that they do things, they get stuff done. And George was that kind of dynamo. You know, he uh, was always out there working for conservation. In the late 60s or, or mid 60s, they heard that the uh, there was a, several acres down by Milford Point that were donated to the state by some sisters for a bird sanctuary where well, the state then leased it out to a guy who just basically made this old hotel into a junkyard. And it was not welcoming for birders. It was not welcoming for birds. So George and others at the bird club said, hey, to the state uh, DEP at the time, give us a lease for this place and we will evict this guy for you and we'll make it friendly for birders and for the public in general. So that's what they did. They convinced the state to give us a one-year lease and we just kept going on one-year leases thereafter. And with that, over the sanctuary at Milford Point, here's a picture of the old hotel building. It is now gone. It's now owned or uh, leased by the Connecticut Audubon Society, and they have their, their new coastal center there. But this is what it looked like when we took it over. And there was all sorts of junk here. Like I said, it was a junkyard. And the, the thing that you'll hear most notably from people who remember it at the time was that there was actually an old helicopter that this guy had collected and just thrown on the property as well. Well, we got rid of all that stuff. We got rid of him as well. And there's several pictures in our archives of cleanups that we did at the uh, sanctuary at Milford Point. And in this, this is a little bit later. So most, most, much of the uh, junkyard debris is already gone. What I think you see here is actually I'm working on the bones of the old hotel, the building itself, because we had a caretaker who would stay there all the time lived there and he really uh, welcomed all birders and any member of the public who wanted to come down and visit the state property. Also in the late 60s, early 70s, a guy named Fred Sibley comes down from Cornell. He's an ornithologist and very interested in birds. So he's also doing lists for us, very interested in, in doing records for the Christmas bird count and so forth. And he has a couple sons who are interested in birding. And here's a picture of two of them, Stephen and David, down at Lighthouse Point Park in 1974, and they are banding birds. So we're back to New Haven Bird Club banding birds, still in 1974. Well, one of these two sons took up a, a liking for painting, 
birds in particular, and would, and here's another picture of that appeared in an article in the New Haven Register of him holding a sparrow. Well, he got pretty good at illustration and pretty good at painting birds. So now what, what any bird would probably tell you is that the, uh, the, the best or the most notable bird guide around, field guide, is authored and illustrated by David Sibley. So we have the honor of him, having him be a, a, an honorary member for us. And he was a junior member back in the time when, his, when he was living in the area and his dad was the president of the club. But we still were doing innovative things even into the 1990s. So this is a picture of John Himmelman. Now, John is an author and illustrator himself, does children's books, and also is a very well learned, learned and author of um, uh, insects, especially nighttime insects like moths. Has done field guides of moths and night singing insects. Well, in 1993, he, it, this wasn't a, a unique idea of sitting in one place and just uh, cataloging the birds that fly by you from this one location, but he made up some quirky rules about it, like that you could only stay within a 17-foot uh, diameter circle, but you could, you know, you could invite your friends, have many people as you want there. So it became sort of a tailgating party that we would always have in October during fall migration, and we ran it for the first few years. The first year, I think it was only like a half dozen or so circles, and they're all around Connecticut, if I remember right. But then the word got out, we started publicizing it more and it became a national and international thing. They then kind of outgrew us. We handed over the reins to the uh, Bird Watchers Digest magazine and they ran it for a few years and now it's kind of come back to us. So we are now running it ourselves. And uh, the bird, uh, the big sit continues to be a, a big event for us in October with people participating in the big sit all around the globe. Well, we still do the things that we've always done, including uh, general meetings. Here's one from 1999. We still do many events outside. You know, thing, COVID and the pandemic have altered things a bit, but we still do them via Zoom or we still do outdoor walks at, 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 as we speak. And we've also done some newer things like about 15 years or so, we started a bird award at the New Haven Science Fair. Did you see a couple of our uh, awardees there? Uh, probably. I don't remember. I don't remember the data. This was probably about ten years ago or so, and uh, we continue to be active, and we are uh, are so appreciative of all the women in the New Haven area who really started the New Haven Bird Club and went on to, you know, foster this uh, all the conservation of the areas that we love and visit today, whether it's East Rock Park, uh, Lighthouse Point Park, or other places in Connecticut, or even the world, like I was talking about with Ernest Coe. And there are, like Gail said, there's about 500 of us today who are members of the club who still carry on the works of the club, take the baton from all those people from over a century ago and try to preserve, uh, we'll try to conserve birds and protect the areas that they live in all around our state and our planet for that matter. And with that, again, I, I can't uh, really thank people enough for all the help that people gave me through the years for collecting all this information because we had sort of the skeleton of what our history was, but all these people that you see on this slide really put color to the picture and allowed me to talk to them, give up, gave their time, gave up their personal photographs of their family members and so forth, and added to the rich history that we have for the New Haven Bird Club. And that is all I have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions with Gail that you may have. Thank you, John. Um, I just like to let our participants know that they can post their questions in the chat and we will share them. And for right now, I have a couple that I'm going to share. Um, people would like to know, have you found any birds that are not native to our area here, especially after big storms? Yeah. yeah we can go. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, we we have a, um, a you know we can now communicate very quickly when a when a rare bird comes into the area, and there's been two spectacular ones lately. One um, one is white pelican, and that that has been seen in in Brantford um, lately. 
Um, and then the other one, and that was just about maybe a month ago, was a roseate spoonbill. And that's an incredible, um, you know, it's a big pink bird with a, you know, a spoon shaped um, long beak. And that was, well, when I saw it, it, it was over at, at Long Wharf. Um, both of those birds, like, you know, usually when we see them, they're like immature birds often, you know, maybe they go in the wrong direction, maybe they get picked up by storm. Um, maybe they just travel with companions going in the wrong direction. Um, but yeah, it, actually looking at, um, at birds after after storms is uh, is when you see a, a lot of rarities. So those are two. Rosie at Spoonville, uh, for those of you, Google, Google this bird right now, incredible. Um, and white pelican, both normally in, in Florida. John, can you think of uh, at, any other hi highlights? And those were easy because those are, those are big. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, there have been many, many over the years. Uh, and one thing I will say that with the tropical storms, usually those are the, uh, the vectors that bring a lot of these southern things to the north because birds get stuck in the winds and they just keep going with it. And they, sometimes they get trapped and they, they, you know, pelagic birds, which are birds that only live way out to sea, get cyclones and then dropped off in inland locations where you'll find them. In fact, back in, I think it was Irene, there's a guy, I live in Prospect and there's a guy who used to work for the Ag Experiment Station who lives just down uh, the road from me a little bit. He had a dead Wilson's uh, storm petrel in his yard, which these are, these are birds you would find when you're way out at sea, but you never know what you might find. I mean, that's part of the cool part about birds and that, that big sit thing is that if you stay in one spot long enough, you might see every species in the world but uh, it may take you longer than you think. Yeah, exactly. Um, Noble Proctor, which is one of the, the members that uh, John mentioned earlier, um, he still, I mean, he's passed away now, but he's still credited with the highest number of species for Connecticut. It's something just under 410. But a, a pretty good birder can expect to see 200, even, even 300 um, species of of birds over the course of the year in Connecticut. In, you know, New Haven itself, you could probably get to 200. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah, yeah, come on our walks, we'll show, we'll show them to you. And I put in the chat, um, CT Birds um, AB, ABA, that's the American Birding Association. If you sign up for that, um, you can, you can um, see the listing of rare birds when they come up in real time. Another question we have is, have there been any major differences in the types of birds or amount of them over the years? It seems like way back in 1907 when you began, there was a lot of bird watching and banding. So have you seen a lot of changes up till now? Uh, and I'll start by answering that. Is that yes? I mean, especially when you broaden the horizon for 100 and 10 plus years, there's been a lot of changes. The uh, early members would never have seen or would be very unlikely to have ever seen a cardinal in Connecticut. They would not have seen mockingbirds in Connecticut. They would not have seen red-bellied woodpeckers in Connecticut. In fact, when, when you look at uh, one of the things that we did in the centennial was that we reprinted the original bulletin. And, uh, you know, I think in the list of accidental birds is uh, tufted titmouse. So in 1907, you would have seen chickadees around, but tufted titmice, tufted titmice, they were really a southern species. They didn't get to Connecticut very often, but uh, as the climate has been warming, climate change and, and global warming, uh, and also the uh, proliferation of feeding birds, which has helped a lot of the seed-eating birds, that they've continued to move north over time. Yeah, and just building on what John said, it um, so here are a, a couple of birds that you can look out for that's pretty easy. So if you're driving up 91 and going past um, exit five, say, um, you're going to see, we're probably going to see black vultures sitting, sitting on the, um, uh, the lamps that are, you know, on the side of the highway. Well, those are southern species too. They it wouldn't have um, uh, seen that previously, um, but they've made their way up. So you know, these this is all good news about birds that are 
um, you know, expanding their um, um, their areas. And there's other good news, like, um, for example, if you go um, in Hamden, if you go on State Street over by W.B. Mason, many of you know that there there is a, a large um, a bald eagle nest there, and there's it's been very successful. And you see the the nestlings every every year, and you can you can go there and and check them out. Um, of course, you you also see the monk parakeets. Um, they started nesting there as well, and there's beautiful green birds, and you can usually hear them before you see them, um, and and that's a, a wonderful sighting as well. So there's a lot of good news. I mean, there there are something you know some birds that you know we we see less often. Um, John, I'm thinking about the rusty blackbirds, you know, that were, that have been listed, you know, early on in the Christmas uh, bird count. Now that's not a, a bird that's, um, you know, kind of familiar to the casual um, birder, but it's a kind of blackbird that we typically see in the, um, in the winter. And um, it's very, very difficult to, to find them now. So some shrinking, some, ex some expanding. Is it true that those monk parakeets were uh, here because of an accident? They were they were in a, a truck spilled monk parakeets out, or is that folklore? I don't know the origin sto story. I know that they're, they're South American um, species, and they've they've found their way here, and they've managed to overwinter. Um, but I don't know. Uh, John, I, I, I always heard that in West Haven along the shoreline, there were so many because a truck that was carrying them to pet a pet store uh, had an accident and they, mm -hmm. but I wasn't sure if that was a true story or not. And, and mm -hmm. I, I think it's probably folklore. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they were a, a, a parrot species in the trade, you know, for pet birds. And uh, there's large numbers of them when you go down south. Now, one interesting anecdote is that for our Christmas bird count, and, and you mentioned West Haven, uh, there was one year, and this is now like 10 or 15 years ago, maybe longer, uh, where we had either the, the most monk parakeets on a Christmas bird count or the second most. Like we only got beat out by Miami. And it was uh, at, a, at a time where you, like you would see them all over the shoreline where they would build those giant nests up against the transformers because you know they're, they're not really a, a northern bird. They need that extra little heat to keep them going. For whatever reason, we've seen them crash, and not crash, but a much less numbers than we saw at that peak where we, we were one of the had one of the highest populations of monk parakeets for a Christmas bird count. My understanding was UI at one point was trying to relocate them because there were many fires on the right. transformers. That's true. We have another question. So people would like to know how they can help birds survive through our winter. What can they, the average person do to help birds? <laughs> well, you know, um, many people uh, put out feeders. Of course, you know, birds are, you know, adapted to our climate gen generally. So they, um, they are pretty um, hardy, but a lot of times putting up a, a feeder, um, a lot of people really enjoy doing that because they get to see the birds more and, um, you know, they start to notice, you know, differences um, among the birds um, uh, more and so forth. And of course, water, um, putting out a bird bath is, is very valuable in, um, in the winter and make it easy for them. Yeah, the, the, the only thing I would add to that is that in addition to the feeding is if you can handle it, now not everybody likes the aesthetics, but if you could let a little part of your yard grow wild with native plants mm -hmm. and just let them go to seed, you know, those seeds and let them be available for the birds come the winter time, that is a tremendous help to them too, because it will help the native species who use the native species. Um, if people have any further questions or they'd like to become a member of the New Haven Bird Club, how can they do that? How can they get yep. a hold of you? Sure, I'll, I'll put um, I'll put contact information um, in the chat so they can they can get in touch. That'd be great. 
Well, if there's no other questions, I don't see any. I'd just like to thank you again, both Gail and John. I look forward to working with you again on some future projects. And uh, we really appreciate your flexibility in uh, having tra to transition from on site at our Pardee Morris house to a uh, Zoom after the hurricane. And yeah. a second hurricane, actually. Yeah, I'm no glad problem. Now, now that we're off the schedule, there'll be no more tropical storms for the rest <laughs> of the year. So you're, you're all good. Right, right. Well, thank you very much. All right, thank oh, you all. No, thank you.